Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lord Bew. Our second speaker this evening is a well-known distinguished Queen's University historian, Professor Mary O'Dodd, who has lectured in Queen's, I think, since the beginning, really, of her academic career. Her research was initially on modern Irish history, but in recent years, she has moved to the uh, themes of women and gender in Irish history. Professor O'Dodd is a founder of the Women's History Association of Ireland, and she's a member of the Royal Irish Academy. And tonight, on International Women's Day, as I think the minister reminded us, Minister Lee Coolan reminded us earlier, uh, Professor O'Dodd is going to talk about women's perspectives in this period. Professor Mary O'Dodd. Right, while the screen is warming up, um, I'll get started, because uh, I think Eamon has put us all to a fairly strict timetable. Okay, I would like to just thank the uh, Community Relations Council for inviting me to participate in this series of lectures, and I'd endorse all the um, gratitude that uh, Paul uh, expressed as well to everybody who is, who is here and has turned up for this series. Um, it's great too, I think, to see the role of women being given such a prominent place in this lecture series because I'm very used to giving the last talk in any series of lectures. Um, and very often you get the impression that women were added in almost as an afterthought, um, that somebody suddenly remembers, oh my goodness, we've no women. Um, so it is very nice to see women placed at the start of the series and also to see women integrated into the program and not just put in uh, at the end. So, um, there will be specific lectures later on on the role of women in Ireland during this period. And indeed, it will be very difficult, I think, throughout this lecture series and throughout this 10 years commemoration of the period 1912 to 1922, not to notice the involvement of women in most of the key events that we will be commemorating. Uh, over the next decade, because women are simply there um, at, at every one of them, I would argue. Over 230,000 women, for example, signed the women's version of the Ulster Covenant in September 1912, while nationalist women participated in the 1916 Rising and later in the Anglo-Irish War. And when the First World War breaks out in 1914, many Irish women um, gather together to raise funds and send practical help to soldiers. And others begin to travel to the war front for the first time to work as nurses. During the decade, too, uh, working class women are active in labor, in the labor movement, um, and active in, in encouraging women workers to join unions. And also, as you probably all know, the campaign for women's suffrage is well underway by 1912. Um, and a landmark event is clearly reached in 1918 when, they are, when women over 30 are given the vote. So the decade does mark a time when women are more visible in public life than at any time previously. And as I say, later in the series, there will be specialists talking about particular aspects of that. So rather than overlap with what will be discussed in those uh, lectures and at those discussions, I thought tonight I would, in a way, go backwards and look at how we get to the situation in 1912 when women are so prominent in public life. Because this isn't a sudden development in 1911 or 1912. Women are involved in public life long before this particular period. And many of the things women do in the 10 years between 1912 and 22, they are already doing before 1912. The numbers of women may have increased incrementally in the first decades of the 20th century, but many of the actual activities that women get involved with um, uh, in public life um, have a much longer history than just going back to this period. 
We could, of course, go back to the medieval period and find aristocratic women who take a public role defending their family's power and status. But this evening, I don't really want to talk about individual wealthy women, but I want to look instead at when large groups of women begin to be involved in political campaigning and begin to offer public support to particular causes. And I think you can date the mobilization of large numbers of women for political purposes to the volunteer movement of the 1770s. The volunteers used women in two ways. First, women were encouraged to attend public meetings and rallies. This, for example, is the famous painting of the Irish Parliament in 1779. And you can see very clearly that the gallery is full of women. And just with a close-up to that, uh, it's a little bit clearer. But one woman there, um, just third from the right, is um, actually dressed in a volunteer-style uniform. Um, and we do have other pictures of, this is just the close-up of the woman from the parliament, and then another uh, painting um, of another woman uh, on horseback wearing her volunteer uniform. And indeed, the woman in the carriage has epaulets on her shoulders. And it's not just these sort of well-off women who could afford to, uh, to buy these uniformed uh, uh, outfits who support the volunteers in public places. Women also attended outdoor rallies and reviews held by the volunteers. This is a detail from another well-known painting of a review in College Green in Dublin. Um, and there's women in nearly every window, again, wearing volunteer colors in their hats and cheering on the review in the square below. The other way in which the volunteers utilize women was through their consumer power as shoppers. Because one of the main political demands of the volunteers is free trade for Irish merchants. And as part of this campaign, women are encouraged to buy Irish and wear Irish-made fashions and textiles. Newspaper editorials call on women to demonstrate their patriotism through what they wear and what they bought. This is an illustration from a very popular magazine, The Hibernian, and it's a, an illustration to show women that you could look fashionable um, in Irish manufactured um, textiles, as the uh, caption puts it underneath. So in other words, the volunteer movement mobilizes women in, in two main ways, and in ways that are to become very familiar in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Women are encouraged to contribute to the popular support of political causes through attendance at meetings and political rallies, and they also participate in a form of consumer politics um, that promoted the purchase of Irish-made goods. And of course, this last campaign is taken up by Sinn Féin uh, in the early 20th century. Going back to the 19th century, in the 1820s, Daniel O'Connell very quickly realized the political advantages of including women in political campaigns. Women were in, permitted to attend the meetings both of O'Connell's Catholic Association and of his Repeal Association. And at these meetings, the gallery really becomes a female space, as you can see from this illustration. But by the time of O'Connell's repeal of the union campaign uh, in the 1840s, women are clearly moving out of the gallery into the main hall. I've just marked, not very elegantly, um, uh, the sections in this illustration from 1843 where you find uh, women. So you can see there's a mass of them in the gallery, but also scattered around the hall, there are also uh, women sitting uh, listening to O'Connell. It could be argued that O'Connell needed the presence of women in his campaigns because it gives his movement a greater sense 
of a mass movement and indeed, I think, a stronger moral force. Because although historians often talk about O'Connell mobilizing the masses, everybody uh, you would ask about O'Connell would immediately say that. But it's not sufficiently recognized, I think, that those masses included men and women. And if O'Connell had only mobilized men, his movement would have looked very different and possibly spilt over into violence, which was what O'Connell always claimed was something he wanted to avoid at all costs. So the presence of women enabled O'Connell to present his movement as being on a higher moral level than, the, uh, than a normal political movement. And this idea that women add a moral force to a political movement is something I think that also appears in later times, particularly for the example in the statements of the Ulster Women's Unionist Council, um, who present their defense of the union as really not about politics, but about a defense of home and children. In the emerging nationalist movements of the Young Irelanders and later the Fenians, there was less need for women as political activists. Women in this painting are presented as really only half listening to the uh, reading of the Young Ireland's newspaper, The Nation. In the Fenian movement, women are given um, roles, but you could argue they are roles closely linked to the domestic role of women. Uh, they work as fundraisers, particularly for prisoners and their families. And women are also asked to give medical assistance and to provide safe houses for uh, prisoners on the run. And this also, of course, becomes a familiar theme for women, a role for women after 1912. So if there is a, a great deal of continuity between women's political activities before and after 1912, there are also developments in the 19th century that begin to make changes in women's lives and I think increase their interest in politics and public life. The most significant of these changes is, I think, education. Because this picture is really testimony to men and women's illiteracy as they have the paper read to them by what looks like maybe the school teacher in, in the community. But gradually in the 19th century, literacy rates for men and women begin to, approve, begin to improve. More women have access to primary school education and girls from the middle classes are also increasingly expected to spend some years um, at secondary school. Here in Belfast, there was of course the famous Victoria College founded by Margaret Byers in 1859. And this is just a picture of graduates from the school in 1905. And Victoria College was one of just a number of secondary school options available in the city to women by about the 1890s. There was undoubtedly a link between the increased education of women and their involvement in public life. Many of the women who are prominent in nationalist political circles after 1912 have received primary, secondary, and a small number of them, indeed, have received a university education, because universities in Ireland begin to open their doors to women in the 1880s. And other women, of course, uh, use their literacy to read newspapers and books and to become more informed about political uh, events. One other event, I think, or development that marked a change in attitude to women's involvement in political life was an import from the United States. And this was the Ladies' Land League, founded by Anna Parnell in 1881. Anna took the model of an all-women's uh, group from the American Ladies' Land League that her sister Fanny had founded uh, in New York. And initially, it was founded really as a charity organization to raise funds for uh, evicted tenants. 
But it becomes more politicised, particularly when it's introduced into Ireland by Anna Parnell in 1881. The Irish Ladies' Land League lasts for less than two years, but during its time, it does mobilise large numbers of women in support of a political cause, a phenomenon that hadn't really happened, I think, uh, since the repeal campaigns of the 1840s. And the all-woman organisation had over 500 branches around the country, all organised by women. And what was significantly new about the Landladies League was that public meetings were held at which women spoke from the platform. And for the vast majority of women, it was their first experience of speaking in public. And this was a new development, because although Connell had masses of women at his meetings, he had not permitted women to speak from the platform. They could attend, but they couldn't speak. Somewhat ironically, the next large-scale all-women's political organisation in Ireland was the Ulster Women's Unionist Council, founded in 1911. And although its political aims are the direct opposite to those of the nationalist-minded Ladies' Land League, the organisation of the UWUC as an all-women's group was in fact very similar to that of the Ladies' Land League. We don't unfortunately have any illustrations of meetings, mass meetings of the Ladies' Land League. We only have this one that I think appeared in a newspaper which is slightly uh, mocking um, of the policemen arriving to see whether these women were doing anything illegal. The formation of the Ladies' Land League was also an indication of wider changes that were happening in relation to women's involvement in politics, because very gradually in the last decades of the 19th century, women do become increasingly involved in formal political uh, politics. From the 80s, they begin to canvass for male MPs, usually relatives, um, and then in the 1890s, they begin to make headway into local government. By 1911, women could stand for local elections, and certain categories of women were able to, uh, to vote uh, for local elections. So in other words, all that was left by that stage was, the, uh, uh, to, give, was to grant women the right to vote and the right to sit in Parliament. So in other words, the suffrage campaign evolves out of a long history of women winning inroads into the, into the political system in different ways. So I will conclude, therefore, with this slide of images of women 1912 to 1922, um, and would suggest that some of these images really have a long tradition and history uh, behind them of women signing petitions, working as nurses, carers, looking after wives and families of prisoners. Um, so the question I suppose I would leave you with, and hopefully might be discussed in, in later series, is that are these new images for women, or are they just being given new uniforms to perform uh, more traditional roles? <laughs>